TLO, what's poppin'? We are on kick, K I C K dot com. We are not live though, so you can leave a like, comment, subscribe. Turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. This is um, the channel you can go to if you miss a live. Highlights, shorts, things of that nature will be on there. Um, don't forget, we do got merch. Wearing it. Merch. You can cop some, support the brand, you know, further the channel. Uh, don't forget, we also got the Discord. I mean, this is Patreon. My bad, Patreon. Just posted Sherlock on there. Uh, I just watched Afterlife. We're going to post that after this video. And uh, don't forget, we got the Discord as well, man. The links to all of this stuff is down below in the description. It's on a link called Linktree. Click that Linktree link and it'll take you to everything, man. This is when a killer realizes his victim is alive. In this case, you are going to learn about a man who has been dubbed Britain's most evil man by many. Levi Belfield. Let's get into it. In this case, you're going to learn about a man who oh. has been dubbed Britain's most evil by many. Levi Belfield is a man without a conscience or remorse, a man who managed to conduct his murderous activities while remaining undetected by the police. Throughout his crime spree, he acquired the nicknames including the Bus Stop Stalker, the Bus Stop Killer, and the Hammer Man. His victims are large in number, and nobody can be 100% sure how many people he targeted over the years. Somebody had to stop this man, but for all of Belfield's crimes, he wasn't stupid, and catching him would not be easy. Before we begin, we would like to send our sincere condolences to the friends and facts, facts, condolences, RIP to the victims, families of all the victims of Levi Belfield. Levi Rabbits was born on May 17, 1968 at the West Middlesex Hospital in London. His father, Joseph Rabbits, died of leukemia when Levi was just 10 years old. He had two brothers and two sisters who all became Bell. That's important. Father's death, something clicked mentally, probably. Fields when their mother remarried. All of them were brought up on a council estate in southwest uh. London. Life was tough and a little rough, but their upbringing was good and stable. Belfield, from a young age, had little or no respect for women. He viewed them as sexual objects that were beneath him, and in many ways, they had been put on the planet for the sexual gratification of men, especially him. He somehow managed to get different partners over a period of years, but his relationships never seemed to last that long. In total, yeah, them two, them two women was decent. They look good. Well, he fathered 11 children with five different women. But tragically, his disdain for women would re- 11 what? 11 women let bro bust in them? 11 women let him get in there unprotected. reach new and disturbing levels as he got older. March the 21st, 2002, a few minutes before 4 o'clock, 13-year-old Millie Dowler makes her way home from school and is captured on CCTV walking down Station Road in Walton-on-Thames, Surrey. Her regular journey to and from school, it was littered with CCTV cameras, all except for a very short distance where there was a blind spot along a busy road. Millie was known to be very opinionated and strong-willed. She was nobody's fool. Everyone was adamant that she would not be tricked by some passing stranger, for example, trying to offer her a ride home if she didn't know them. But nonetheless, whilst walking through a CCTV blind spot at approximately 20 or 30 yards in length, Millie disappeared without a trace. Naturally, Millie's family became concerned when she didn't return home from school. She was a good girl who would always maintain contact with her family. Even if she had gotten sidetracked on the way home, they were sure that she would have let them know. Given Millie's age and the fact that the disappearance was so out of character, police sprang into action, bringing into play all the extra resources they could muster. But the search yielded no results and no leads. Meanwhile, just across town, in a place called West Drayton, 34-year-old Levi Belfield and his 23-year-old girlfriend Emma were house-sitting for a friend. 
According to his girlfriend, Levi had been out of the house all day and did not return until 11 p.m. that evening, bringing takeaway for both of them. After eating, the pair went to bed, but rather than being tired, Levi laid in bed for a few hours, and then around 3 in the morning, he said he couldn't sleep and decided to go back to the couple's apartment at Walton-on-Thames. Emma had no suspicions about Belfield going back to the apartment. Lots of people find it hard to sleep when they're not in their own beds. True. But this would change when Emma returned to the apartment the next day, when even his loyal girlfriend became suspicious of his behavior. Upon returning to the apartment, Emma noticed it was spotless, and on top of all that, all of the bed covers had been thrown away. Belfield explained that her dog had had an accident and the sheets were ruined, so he had thrown them away. But Emma noticed something else was wrong. Her car was missing, the same car that Belfield supposedly used to get from the house in West Drayton to their apartment in the early hours of the morning. Again, Belfield had an explanation. He said that he went for a... <laughs> Yo. Big t-shirt draws is crazy drink with someone and had had too much to drive, so he had left the car. Remember, Levi Belfield left the apartment around 3 a.m. Who wants their friend coming around that time of the morning for a drink? Naturally, Emma wanted her car back, and the couple made their way around to where it was supposed to be. But the car wasn't there. Emma, as a matter of fact, would never see that car again. Yeah, Despite her reservations, Emma let the episode slide. It is likely that she suspected Belfield of having relations with another woman, but she stuck with him anyway. Young and dumb. 23 and let the car slide? Not 23, my bad. Whole car missing. And she's just like, eh, it's okay. I love you. And the couple got a new home together in Little Benty, West Drayton. Belfield made quite an impression on his new neighbors. Most of the street thought he was a nice guy, but he had a habit of leaving vehicles parked in awkward places so people had to keep asking him to move them. You may know yourself from personal experience that it doesn't take long for this to become annoying. very annoying. But it didn't take long for Belfield's attitude to change. Neighbors noticed that he took a particular dislike to an elderly couple living on the same street. He would give them verbal abuse and was even suspected of spreading weed killer all over the couple's garden, destroying it. This was particularly callous because the elderly man loved gardening. It was his pride and joy. What he was trying to achieve, nobody really know. Hey. But just to make sure that nobody went near his home, he bought two dogs that were, to say the least, not very friendly towards people. Couple that with barbed wire he used to cover the stolen fences, and you can see why his neighbors became uneasy about him. Now, with his garden looking more like a prisoner of war camp, people wondered what he was hiding. Levi and Emma's neighbor at the time also spoke of his concerns about their home life, saying, They played the part of a couple, happy couple and all that, but Emma's whole demeanor told a different picture. So he was getting abusive in the home? I think Emma was very fearful. I think Levi bullied her. She cried quite a lot. You know, a happy person doesn't do that. I don't know what he was trying to achieve. I don't know what he was hiding. But it was all very strange. But Belfield's mental state is highlighted no better than by comments of an ex-girlfriend. His mood swings were so unpredictable, he would go from loving and caring to aggressive and horrible in the blink of an eye. At mealtimes, I had to separate his foods. The potatoes would have to be separate from the carrots, and the meat wouldn't be allowed to touch anything else on the plate. I know people like that, and they don't like their food to touch. He used to make me eat one of everything on his plate because he was convinced I was trying to poison him. When I was first pregnant with my daughter, he was absolutely over the moon. Then it changed because he already had girls with his previous partner and he'd always wanted a boy. So it kind of went downhill from there. Do not go to fabletters.com. Do not take our historically low offer. Meanwhile, the police were still searching for Millie Dowler. Six months had passed and no luck. 
That is, until the 18th of September 2002. A group of mushroom pickers were going about their business in a dense woodland called Yately Heath, Hampshire. One of them noticed something strange. Upon approaching it, they discovered the partly decomposed naked body of a young girl. The body was so badly decomposed that a cause of death could not be ascertained. But using dental records, investigators were able to learn, sadly, that the remains were those of Millie Dowler. None of her possessions were found in the area. At the time of her disappearance, she had been carrying a mobile phone, a bag, a purse, and of course, she was wearing her school uniform. With the discovery of the body, police now reclassified the investigation a as a murder, naming it Operation Ruby. But while police were investigating the murder, the man they were looking for would strike again, just down the road. Hampton, Middlesex, a leafy historic suburb outside of London, was to become the scene of yet another murder on February 4, 2003. On this chilly evening, Marcia McDowell, a young student just 19 years old, was making her way home, having been to the movies with a friend. Marcia caught the 111 bus to take her home. Having left the bus, she made her way around the corner and turned onto the street where her parents lived. As she approached to within eye shot of her home, approximately a hundred. That's see, this is my whole thing, man. Like men, men who search for younger women to date, and date younger women. Like I'm talking younger, like 15 years younger than them. Like they're 30 something, and the women are 20, 21, 19. Like to me, they're, they're so, like it's a little weird. Just to me, it's a little weird. Like when you actively searching for young women to date. Like if a, if a young woman comes up on you, cool. Like it, it's, a, it's a little different because you're not searching. But when you searching, it, it give me like, like it's like you damn near weird to me. I don't know why, but like it's a little weird like. It's all like, I'm going to keep my eye on you. Yards from the front door, Marsha was attacked. In the middle of a silent, cold night, Marsha... And I say that because it's, it's the current girl, he's with his 23 and he's 33. I mean, it's only a 10-year difference, but like he got five baby mamas, 11 kids. I'm pretty sure he's... They're all younger women, like... like ...was walking without a care in the world as her breath streamed out of her mouth in front of her face when, without warning, someone came up behind her and struck her in a merciless, powerful blow to the back of the head. Such was the ferocity of the blow, Marcia was left instantly unconscious. She was eventually seen, and an ambulance was called, but tragically, they couldn't save her. Dang. She was admitted to the intensive care with severe head injuries, but the next day, she sadly died. One punch? She probably, like, fell and... Hit her head too, but like that. The investigation into Marsha's senseless attack began immediately. Oh, it was Fortunately, a buses in the UK have CCTV fitted, and this gave police their only and very tenuous lead. As Marsha got off the bus, a silver Vauxhall Corsa was seen near the bus stop. As Marsha made her way from the Percy Road bus stop and around the corner, the Corsa followed her. On the face of it, seeing a car like this might seem like a good lead, but Vauxhall Corsas are Popular very common in the UK. They account for nearly 3% of all cars driven in Britain. To make matters worse, the CCTV image wasn't good enough to get a good look at the registration plate. Meanwhile, Levi Belfield had gotten himself a legitimate job. He was working as a doorman for several pubs and cl I keep showing this picture. clubs. This job suited him down to the ground. He loved fighting, and he was aggressive, and he liked getting his own way. So if anything ever went wrong at the doors, and somebody started fighting, Belfield was more than happy to get involved. People who knew Belfield have said that his love for violence and his obsession with having big muscles came from his childhood. As a child, Belfield was a weak boy who was the apple of his mother's eye. He and still a weak man, apparently. He slept in her bed until he was 16. I'm telling you, not having that father after 10 years old play that role, play the role. And she literally wiped his backside until he was 12. Even in his 30s, whenever he would go and see his mother, 
he would still, strangely, sleep in her bed. Belfield was also continuously bullied throughout his school years. His nickname at school was Bugsy, and not because he looked like the 1920s American bully. gangster. There was a rumor, and we must stress it was a rumor, that Belfield had sex with his 15-year-old sister's rabbit and then broke its neck. The label, true or not, would haunt him all the way through school. Police now said they had what they believed to be two separate investigations going on. They still had not found the so-called... So he was a victim of a fatherless home after the age of 10, and he was bullied. And he was cradled by his mother until he was a grown man, apparently. It's never gonna... This is, this is all bad. The bus stop killer who had taken Millie Dowler's life nor had they any evidence or suspects. And now they were hunting the so-called Blitz Killer after the type of brutal random attack unleashed on Marsha McDonald. And all they had to go on there was the silver Vauxhall Corsa, which may as well have been a needle in a haystack. For real. Teachers of Tomorrow, I was calling... What's Teachers of Tomorrow? I got kids, and I got a kid, so I gotta be looking out for stuff like that. Teachers of tomorrow. It was now two years since the murder of Millie Dowler and a year since the murder of Marsha McDonald. Little or no progress had been made in either investigation. Their killer or killers remained on the loose. On the 28th of May, 2004, at Islesworth, Middlesex, just miles from where Millie and Marsha had been killed, an 18-year-old student named Kate Sheedy was making her way home after a night. 13, 19, 18. And he dates younger women. Certified weird guy, man, in my opinion. I'll Out with friends. Just like poor Marsha McDonald about a year earlier, she caught the bus and then began walking down the street where she lived. She was walking on the left-hand side of the street when a car drove past her, broke sharply, and pulled onto the pavement. Kate had her wits about her and didn't like the situation, and as a precaution, she crossed the road to walk on the other side. But the driver didn't like Kate's actions and would not be deterred. As Kate crossed the road, the car spun around and drove at her at speed, knocking poor Kate off her feet. What was even worse is the driver, having run over Kate once, put the car in reverse and drove over her for a second time. The car then accelerated and spun off into the night in the same direction it had and come from. And not to mention, he was probably on roids as well. He was probably on roids because he had an obsession with being big and, you know, some people just can't get big naturally. So he was probably not, you know, messing with his testosterone levels, his body chemical chemicalization, it's all, all type stuff. From leaving Kate for dead. Kate's injuries were horrific. Every single one of her ribs had been broken, her spleen was ruptured, and she had spinal damage. But astonishingly, she was still alive, although it was very touch and go for a time whether or not she would live. But to the relief and surprise of many, Kate did slowly start to defy the odds and make a gradual recovery. As her body grew stronger, so did her memory. She was it's a good thing about being young when it needs, well, you know, this is never a good situation, but being young in this situation, your body can heal a lot faster and a lot more, a lot better. Able to tell investigators that the car was a white people carrier with blacked out windows. Even more amazing, she remembered what could have been a minor but crucial detail. The wing mirror on the driver's side of the vehicle was smashed. Unfortunately, despite police attempting to investigate the crime, they had managed to miss the white vehicle which had actually been captured on CCTV footage, but due to what they called an administrative error, terrible policing as usual, no surprise to me. The message was never relayed. Meanwhile, Belfield was free to carry on working as a nightclub doorman, remaining completely under the police radar. Belfield's behavior now was becoming even more erratic and frequent. One night, he revealed to someone that he knew at the club that he was working at that there was a room upstairs that he took young girls to when the club was closed. Once in the room, the girls would face abuse, not just verbal, but sexual. 
Sometimes Belfield would also take them to his vehicle parked outside. This vehicle, a white people carrier with blacked out windows. The bus stop killer was not done yet. Just three months after the attempted murder of Kate Sheedy, Detective Chief Inspector Colin Sutton received the call he had been dreading. Another body had been found, this time on Twickenham Green, just down the road from where Kate had been attacked. The body turned out to be that of 22-year-old Amélie Delagrange, a French-language student who had come to the UK to study. A French-language student, so she already the barrier, the language. France and the UK not far apart, but she might. For two years. Her body was found An on a green student. used as a cricket pitch, approximately halfway across. Police now made the final connection to at least one of the murders that had taken place in the local area, that of Marsha McDonald. Emily had been attacked in the same way. She had received a very powerful blow to the back of her head, almost certainly leaving her unconscious. Just like some of the other young women before her, Emily had been out at night with her friends and had taken a bus home. But police believe that she may have fallen asleep. He's definitely a serial then. This is a serial. Would we consider him serial? On the bus and missed her stop because she asked the driver how long it would be before the bus would return in the opposite direction. The driver told her it would only be about 10 minutes, but Emily decided to walk with tragic consequences. Emily walked back, approaching Twickenham Green. She could have walked around, but decided to take the shorter route across the field instead. During her walk over the green, the killer seized the opportunity. In his quest to find out who had killed Emily, DCI Sutton made himself rather unpopular with his colleagues by reopening older investigations that hadn't been solved. This included Millie Dowler, Marsha McDonnell, and Kate Sheedy. You know what I'm saying? Like, why would his, his, his co-workers, his other police detective brethren, be upset that he's opening it? Like, it's to solve a case. They too worried about the, they too was worried about the, the, the numbers and the, the ratios of solving to not solving and the politics of it all when they do good police work from the jump. You know what I'm saying? If this is what needs to happen, then it's what needs to happen. All had been within a relatively small area, and DCI Sutton's opinion was the possibility that they were all linked had to be explored. While the DCI was working hard to get justice for the young girls and their families, Belfield found himself a new occupation, one that he enjoyed very much. He had gone into the private clamping of vehicles, but you wouldn't be surprised to learn that his business wasn't completely legitimate. He wasn't just doing it. Of course not. He was exploiting people for sure. For the money, he enjoyed clamping people who had parked legally as well. When they challenged him, he would extort them for money through intimidation until they paid. Given his love of conflict, he probably would have preferred had they not pay. Then there would be a chance at some violence. He didn't just go around the streets looking for cars to clamp either. He actually got people to come to him, believe it or not. <coughs> he would place certain discreet advertisements around for a brothel that he pretended to own. When someone responded to the advert, he would advise them of the address. Once they left their vehicles to go into the brothel that didn't exist, he would go over and clamp. So it was like... This is almost airtight. You over here looking for a brothel that's not in, not even a thing. And then he clamps your car. What are you going to tell people? Man, I was looking for this brothel. And Clamp their wheels. Prostitution is illegal yeah, in the UK. Illegal, right? These people couldn't go to the police, leaving them. He found him a lick. Them with no choice but to pay Belfield. And there's nothing holding you back. What would your thing be? Extortionist at his greatest. Best description for Doris. He's an extortionist and a weirdo and almost a pedo at the same time. In my opinion, man, that's the vibes. <laughs> Unbeknown to him, DCI Sutton was making slow but steady progress. Having checked the mobile phone records, he noticed that Emily's mobile phone had not been switched off like the others. Maybe her killer had gotten overconfident or forgetful. 
Her phone had been left switched on until 20 minutes after her body had been found. The phone had moved from Twickenham Green to Walton-on-Thames. It simply wasn't possible to do this journey in 20 minutes. The police knew the killer had a vehicle, and given it was late at night, spotting a vehicle in the different locations wouldn't be that difficult. The police set about checking all the CCTV footage. To be precise, 2,000 hours of CCTV footage looking for matching vehicles along the different routes that could have been taken. Well, they weren't doing it good because they skipped the van earlier, so hopefully they did it better than this, that time. Finally, after the monotonous task had been completed, police did notice one vehicle that appeared in both locations. It seemed to be a small van, which police were confident was a Ford. The problem, same as with the Vauxhall Corsa, Can is that it is a very common vehicle. Oh. Ford vans are the most common in the UK, and in the London area alone, there was between 24 and 25,000 of them on the road. The police now decided to launch a public appeal for the vehicle, something that isn't too common so early in an investigation. But eliminating 25,000 vans would take too long. They needed to find this vehicle and the driver as quickly as possible. And DCI Sutton's strategy would generate a strong lead. A lady went to a local police station shortly after the appeal, claiming to know who the killer was. Her name was Joanna Collins. That's Joanna was mama. the ex-girlfriend of Levi Belfield and knew exactly what he was capable of. Police took her and her statement very seriously. Firstly, she had first-hand knowledge of him. Secondly, they had no other suspects, so it was certainly a lead worth following up. When DCI Sutton checked Belfield's criminal record, there wasn't anything terribly serious there, but something did leap out at him. In May of 2004, Belfield had been arrested in a white Toyota Previa. This car matched the descriptions given by Kate Sheedy. It was the people carrier. Compound this with the fact that DCI finally found it again. Guy Sutton discovered Belfield had also owned a silver Vauxhall Corsa. He now believed he car. had enough to bring him in for questioning. On the 20th of November 2004, DCI Sutton and his team went to Belfield's home in the very early morning hours to bring him in. What channel is this? I'm, let me sub up something that y'all should do as well. Police entered the home, but there was no sign of him. They searched everywhere, and just as it began to look like they were going to have to look somewhere else, a sergeant on the team decided to open up the attic or loft as a last resort. Climbing the ladder and shining his flashlight... The last resort, that should just be a part of searching the house, because it's in the house. A naked Belfield was seen trying to hide in the corner. The sergeant grabbed him and said those famous words in British policing, You're nicked. News spread fast of Belfield's arrest. People who had previously been scared of him now saw their chance to tell police exactly what he had been getting up to. The wall of silence and intimidation was crumbling. At one stage, DCI Sutton had 27 separate investigations open into Belfield. These ranged from murder to assault to several rape allegations. But there was still a problem. Evidence was proving hard to come by. The police needed a working hypothesis if they were going to connect Belfield to any of the attacks and murders that had taken place. Joanna, the ex-girlfriend who had come forward first, became a very important witness for the police. She gave her full account of living with Levi Belfield, which told its own story. She described how he would only hit her on the legs or body, where the bruises could be covered up, never in the face. If she dared to scream, cry, or wince in pain, she would be hit again, even harder. Whenever they drove down the street, she said that he would make very inappropriate comments about schoolgirls that were walking down the road. What did I tell you? That's red flagging. You know what I'm saying? Weirdos. That's a weirdo. And she described how he spoke about women. He had a real disdain for women, a genuine dislike of them. As far as he was concerned, they were inferior to him. It became apparent that although he had little regard for any women, he had a special hatred for middle-class women, an inferiority complex about proving that he was better than them. 
But because he wasn't better than them, the only way he could possibly prove this in his mind was to degrade or even kill them. Levi Belfield was formally charged on the 2nd of March 2006. DCI Sutton said that despite the seriousness of the case, he took great pleasure in finally sitting across the table from Belfield and reading out the charges. But there was no reaction from the remorseless, emotionless, and somewhat soulless Belfield. He only said two words during the whole process, not guilty. In 2007, Levi Belfield finally went on trial at the Old Bailey in London. He was charged with the murders of Marsha McDonald and Amelie Delagrange and the attempted murder of Kate Sheedy. Throughout the whole proceedings, it was noted how disinterested he was, spending long periods of time staring at the ceiling or picking at his fingernails. He continued to deny all the charges against him and tried to present himself to the jury as polite and well-spoken, and he would not hurt a fly. Thankfully, this cut little ice with the judge or the jury. Belfield had no credible defense whatsoever. The words of denial may have left his mouth, but his body language said, Why am I here? I haven't done anything wrong. This is a waste of my time. On the 25th of February, 2008, Levi Belfield was found guilty on all charges. And in quite a rare move for the UK, he was given a whole life term, which means he will never... R.I.P. to the victims, the UK. This is the first time I've ever heard of them getting a sentence right. <laughs> Boy, you ain't never seeing the light of day. We got four and one right here. Pedo, a, a murderer, a, 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 a weirdo. Like, just we just got him. Book him. Be released. He offered no explanation or mitigation and expressed no remorse for his actions. He just accepted the verdict. Although this was, of course, good news, the verdict had brought some justice for those poor young women and closure for the family, the same could not be said for the friends and family of Millie Dowler, whose death remained unsolved. DCI Sutton, however, was not done with Belfield yet. There had been so many allegations against him, surely at least some of them, if not all, had some truth to them. In the conclusion of the case, Mr. Sutton noticed that Belfield had once lived in Walton-on-Thames in the flat that he shared with his girlfriend, Emma. DCI Sutton noticed that the address where Belfield had lived, called Cullingwood Place, was only 20 yards from the spot where Millie Dowler was last seen. It was now six years since Millie had been murdered. Finally, DCI Sutton believed they had a credible suspect. In February of 2008, the police announced publicly that Levi Belfield was now the prime suspect in the Millie Dowler case. Police reviewed the CCTV footage again from 2002. Now let's not forget Levi Belfield had left his girlfriend in the house in the early morning hours because he couldn't sleep. That house was just 20 minutes away from where Millie had been seen. Not far at all. CCTV footage showed that just 10 minutes after Millie had been caught on camera, a red Daewoo Lexia was seen leaving Collingwood Place, the exact same car that Belfield's girlfriend owned, the exact car that went missing and was never seen again. Is this your sports betting strategy? I don't understand why they couldn't put that together at the time of the events. Like, they had all that information at the time it happened. I guess they just wasn't looking for him, though, at specific. I don't know. In May of 2011, Levi Belfield was finally put on trial for the murder of Millie Dowler. Joanna Collins, the ex-girlfriend, appeared as a witness, as did Belfield's most recent girlfriend, Emma. Many witnesses, including Emma, gave evidence from behind a screen, but Joanna refused and wanted to look at the man that had tortured her for so long. This visibly agitated Belfield as he sat looking aggressively across the court, rocking backwards and forwards over and over throughout the proceedings. This was the point he realized that nobody was scared of him anymore, nor did he have any hold over the women that he had abused for so long. 
The trial lasted seven weeks. Levi Belfield was found guilty of the murder good. of Millie Dow. He can't get no much more time, but good. And that's closure for the family. Was handed a second whole life term. Hold on. As the guilty verdict was read out, Belfield arrogantly yawned. <laughs> that guy wrote two life sentences, the kind that, that has no minimum. And in court. Since being imprisoned, Belfield has been determined to try to cling on to his infamy, repeatedly confessing to murders in the UK from his prison cell. His confessions have reached such an extent that now very few people, if any, take him seriously. Although there is no death penalty in the UK, Belfield was given the next best thing. He was sent to Wakefield Prison in Yorkshire first, but after complaining about conditions and perhaps as an act of vengeance by the state, he was moved to HMP Franklin, Franklin. in the northeast of England. Along with Belmarsh, probably the most notorious prison in the UK, it has been home to criminals such as Harold Shipman, Charles Bronson, and Peter Sutcliffe. The prison has an extremely strict regime and inmates spend 23 hours a day in their cells. Even the hardened criminals who talk of Franklin fear return to that hellhole. In 2016, Belfield himself found out when a fellow prisoner slashed his face with a homemade knife. My bad. Even your average bank robber or gangster will not abide child killers. Since the attack, Belfield has complained that prison guards have beaten him up and also allow other prisoners to have access to him to inflict harm. Back to your school days, huh? Back to getting bullied. You know, it's full circle. History repeats itself, so... Naturally, we wouldn't possibly condone such behavior. No, absolutely not. We don't condone that type of stuff. I don't even know why I was clapping. I was trying to kill a fly. But we'll leave it up to you to decide what's right or what's wrong or what's appropriate. The streets are now undoubtedly safer without Levi Belfield walking them. Thankfully, he will never this picture is killing me. be free to inflict harm on anyone ever again, destined to live the rest of his life looking over his shoulder 24 hours a day. As always, here at Beyond Evil, our thoughts are with the victims and the friends and family. Moment of silence. Continue. Millie Dowler, 13 years old. Marcia McDonald, 19 years old. Emily Delagrange, 22 years old. And perhaps the luckier of the four, Kate Sheedy, 18 years old, who astonishingly managed to survive. These four I wonder if she got survivor's remorse or anything. She definitely got the PTSD going on. Four young women all salute to you, young lady. Had their lives or ma'am in front of them. None of them had done anything wrong to anybody. They were just going about their daily business, whether it was going home from school or going out with a group of friends. These poor women were all unfortunate enough to come in contact with Levi Belfield. A bitter, control freak of a man who believed that these women had some sort of perverse duty to comply with his demands. We wish all of them peace. For sure, man. TLL, leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post.